I kind of feel like there would have to be like video of this for people to understand the significance of the countdown that we always talk about, but no one ever gets to see except for us. Yeah, that's true. It's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a big deal. Just, you know, numbers flashing by on the screen. It's, it, it feels yeah. significant without there being any significance. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. It's a oh, man. crappy day out today. Oh, it's yeah? cold. It's now raining. And of course, Emmy wants to go outside and explore all the time because she has boundless amounts of energy. I'm like, no, we're not going outside. It is cold and yeah. I'm not freezing to death just so that you can play with leaves and sticks and mulch. Does she enjoy being out there when it's raining? It doesn't deter her. Yeah. Uh-huh. Which is nice. I mean, when I was looking... So I have two different books on Cavalier King Charles Spaniels, which is her one half. And they claim that calves really aren't like outdoor dogs, that they don't care for the outside. So clearly Emmy did not get any of that, any of those traits. (laughs) She's Mm. very much so seems to be an outdoor dog, which I am, by all means, I'm cool with that. But it gets to be annoying when she wants to run around in circles underneath the pool deck just because she never, she's always at 100. Yeah. So... Meanwhile, Lucy's Lucy's eyes turn like start to get red because she's super tired, but she keeps going or she keeps getting attacked by Emmy and it's this whole ordeal <laughs> and I'm like whatever. So I've been putting them down, forcing them into their crates, which isn't like not truly forcing them, but putting yeah. them down for a nap in their crates uh around this time every day, just so they get some kind of rest because emmy otherwise gets cranky and then she gets more violent so (laughs) yeah (laughs) violent puppy yeah i um i uh our dog oliver he he does not enjoy the rain there is uh we had a a little bit of a storm that went through um about this almost this time last week and we we usually don't get very exciting weather here but this one when the storm front came through there was some lightning and thunder and some you know big wind and big rain and just as it was starting, I went out onto the patio and uh, was sitting under one of the patio umbrellas, just having breakfast as the first few drops were starting to fall. And Oliver came running out the uh, the doggy door and in his mouth, he had this, uh, it's it's a yak cheese kind of chewy thing for him. And he comes out with it. It looks like he's got a cigar in his <laughs> mouth, but he, he uh, comes out the doggy door, is really excited to run over to me. And then he gets hit by like, three raindrops. And you can see that just that decision in his head of like, nope, 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 nope. And it yeah. ran right back inside the house again. And he tried one more time and got hit by a couple more raindrops. And then he would just was inside the house staring at me through the, uh, the sliding glass door uh, as I was enjoying the storm outside. So does, does not enjoy being outside when it's rainy or windy or cold or, or anything like that. So but it's, it's also good because it means that he doesn't get, doesn't really get dirty, doesn't really get muddy. And, uh, and, and avoids uh, everything along those lines. So there's some advantages to that for sure. I saw a video the other day of a little, I don't know what kind of dog it is, kind of around the size of what Emmy and Oliver are, terrier mm-hmm. type dog. And the guy that was taking the video, the owner, was gave him a little umbrella to hold on to in his mouth So because he doesn't like the rain. <laughs> so this dog went out, held the umbrella in his mouth, went, did its business, and then came back around and it was happy as could be so <laughs> there you awesome. go you got to get that for oliver and teach teach him how to walk around and pick things up with his mouth yeah yeah that would be good and speaking of of teaching them things uh so i mean oliver knows like the 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 main commands you know the sit stay uh down place you know all, all the all the main stuff in terms of just like keeping control then my wife was teaching him some of the the fun ones like, you know, like high five, shake, wave, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And uh, the other day he was on sort of the, the, the edge of the couch and I was just kind of like kneeling on the floor kind of in front of it, just kind of like giving him some attention and stuff. And, and he had his, his, little, his paws kind of out in front of him. And I just kind of put my, my arm up as though I was going to arm wrestle him. I said, let's arm wrestle. And then sure enough, when he gets confused, he doesn't really know what to do. So he just offers a paw. <laughs> so he just puts his paw in my hand and then I just, you know, I had to arm wrestle him and, uh, you know, I let him win. Oh, of course. Um, Why but, wouldn't uh, you? Yeah. Yeah. But these, these are the, uh, the, the fun things, uh, 
fun things you can do with dogs. Does, does it doesn't work as well with cats. They're they're not quite as trainable. Though I will say that my cats they they know their names. You call their name, they'll they'll you know they'll they'll come running. But uh, <laughs> not not as good for the the fun tricks and such. Yeah, I haven't even started like really heavily training or anything with that, or especially haven't really given much thought into little tricks for Emmy. That's still she's in her four month stage of. I can learn things, but I'm going to listen to them when I want to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Selective uh, attention. Yeah, she's got, I figure in January when she's six months, that's when really all of the training will take place and really start to nail everything down more so. Yeah. And then after she has like the basics, the sit, come, stay, down, uh, heal, all of those, um, then we'll go into the more of the fun stuff, like stand and sit yeah. pretty and all the fun things that you can do with a poodle. So <laughs> <laughs> that'll be cool. That'll be cool. I, that's, seems like that's, that's when things will get, uh, especially fun. Uh, and you, and you can kind of work with their natural behaviors and, yeah. and, uh, everything along those lines. Yeah. That same person that is, I saw the video of that had the dog with the umbrella, that same dog. It's a, um, the guy lives on like a homestead kind of ranch thing. And, mm -hmm. And he was building, working outside, and he's always like working on his house or building stuff. And if he drops something, he'll have his dog, Minion, go get it. So he was <laughs> like, he'll, the dog will come over and bring like the chalk line over to him or bring the, uh, the chisel that he dropped when he was trying to work on something. Just little, little fun tricks like that of like, oh, go get this, go get this thing for me because I dropped it. And just, yeah, yeah, making the dogs useful and work for you because. I mean, it works their brain, so why not? I really should have Oliver do some more things for me and, and, and like help with the the print portfolios <laughs> and the the zine and that that would be beneficial. I mean, he he just will like sit in his little nest made of blankets and just stare at me as as I work on stuff. But uh, that's 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 what I've been up to for the past well since since we recorded last. The zine should be. I heard from the print shop that they're saying it should ship to me on the 28th of November. Okay. Um, after which I'll be able to start, you know, shipping out the portfolios and everything else. So I'm doing everything I can on my end to get everything else ready. Um, so for the past uh, few days or so, I've been working on basically getting all the prints ready for the print portfolio so i'll go back and I'll, I'll number them on the back and i'll sign them on the back and uh it's a lot of work it, it's it's i forget how much work everything is um when i launch the pre-order each year and it, it's a little bit tricky because you know with so many of them being pre-ordered early on and and then by the time it comes to you know the vast majority of it, you know, everything's paid for and everything. And then it's just this process of, I just feel like I'm just spending lots of money on things that, you know, cause that's all money that came in a while back. Yeah. So just like when it comes to like ordering the, the zines and stuff like that, I'm just, the money is just, you know, flying out the door. So it's, it's a little bit of a weird thing with the pre-orders. I, 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 I do wish that there was, and maybe there is a little bit of a better way of doing that where it, it kind of spreads it out a little bit more, but I also do need to have the pre-order to kind of figure out how many of them to make. And and so that's, that's part of that process as well. Yeah. I mean, that's gotta, um, like you were saying, that's gotta be weird to have all that money up front and like months in advance. And then all of a sudden you're starting yeah. to pay for the, the tools and utilities and all of the stuff that you need. Yeah. It's, yeah. Mean, meanwhile, it's, it's like ticking down in the background because, you know, this is a time of year when like the property tax bill comes in and, <laughs> yeah. you know, all, all the other stuff that comes with it. Or I just, it, at a certain point, it feels like I'm doing a lot of work for like not very much return. And, and, you know, maybe that is somewhat the case. But at the same time, you know, when it comes time to do the taxes each year, then I, you know, add in all the expenses and everything, you know, everything works out fine. But but yeah, it, it's it's a little it's a little bit uh, a little bit tough this time of year just because it is it is a lot of work. And I think from the outside, when people see the print portfolios, it seems like a simple enough thing to put together. But it it is a lot of it is a lot of work. Um, so it's 
it's coming along and I'm very much looking forward to when the zines show up so that I'm able to start, you know, shipping out the, the orders and everything. But, uh, then, then that, that clock will get reset and then it'll be off on, on more trips to find more stuff and, and all that. But yeah, it's, it's kind of a strange way of doing things, but I mean, it, it works, but man, it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, when we were talking in the beginning of, before we start recording about that and the potential for raising price of it. And I definitely think that that is overdue like given yeah. like how you say about the, the amount of work that goes into it, especially now that you're adding into the zine and all the other stuff that you're yeah. doing. That's, I could definitely yeah, foresee it, a price it's increase. A tricky, it's a tricky thing when it comes to pricing stuff. Um, and you know, in, in the past, I've always, the, the formula I've used is, you know, price it at, at a price point where it makes it worth the time and effort to produce and also seems like a reasonable enough value for the customer. Um, and I think that's an easier thing to quantify if it's just like an individual print that a person is ordering. To me, that's a little easier to price in some way because it's a bit more of a straightforward thing in terms of the amount of time it takes and kind of that, that feeling of, oh, this is worth it. When the order comes and you see that, you get a little excited about it. But it's a little bit more difficult when it comes to something like the print portfolios. And I, I, I do think I'll need to kick the price up a little bit next year. Um, not a large amount, but just, just a little bit. And then hopefully it'll still be uh, well-received enough. And just as, we were, as, as you had mentioned, as we were chatting before we started recording, by doing the zine and the portfolio this year, and the combination of them, it, it kind of kicks the price up a little bit. And it, it didn't seem to have a, a negative effect. I, I think at about the same time last year, I think I had I had sold maybe maybe even a little bit less in terms of the print portfolio. So I don't know. Um, but it's it's definitely one of those tricky things when it comes to the pricing. And and I know that's something that you you've always you've had some thoughts on as well when it comes to like pricing your prints and stuff along right, those lines. Yeah, pricing is always going to be a tricky thing and what would be especially odd for me if i were to come out with a folio too is the fact that i love my 8x10 prints like as just individual prints to sell and then yeah. you're collecting them in a box and selling those so trying to like if i'm selling an 8x10 print for say a hundred dollars how am i going to price the folio box set that that individual print still seems worth getting but so does the folio box you know what I mean? Like that, that could yeah. be quite, uh, quite difficult to try and navigate. I don't have any plans of doing a print shop or folios just yet anyway. So yeah, future problems. Yeah. One, one thing I was thinking about as I was working on the zine and it'll be interesting because I, I honestly have no real feeling about how it's going to turn out. I mean, hopefully it'll be pretty decent. I know I'm going to learn a lot of stuff in the process, but I also think that you know, there could be some possibilities for other sorts of uses of the zine. I'm not sure what that could be, whether it's some sort of retrospective work, whether it's, it is some way of combining the the written journals. Um, but there's just, there, there are so many different ways out there to be creative and to experiment with different mediums. And um, I do enjoy the learning process of it, you know, from doing the, the eBooks and now the zine and everything else. But there's just there's just so much potential out there, and, and I always like it when I see you know a photographer doing new and different sort of stuff, kind of like we were talking about with uh, Nick Carver when he did his uh, his his series and and everything associated with that with the gallery show and everything. Um, but there's there's just so much I think that you know if there's so much that you could do if you just dedicate the time and the sort of the learning curve to it. And, and I, I do appreciate seeing that sort of stuff that it isn't just like, you know, cookie cutter, you know, whether it's, you know, you know Lightroom presets or, you know, <laughs> stuff along those lines. Yeah. Uh, not, not, not as creative in that sense. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned, I think, yeah, last week I mentioned about Craig Maud and his aloneness article that he had put out and uh, mm -hmm. he actually just released today. Well, today, if you are members tomorrow if you're not a member of his like special projects membership program his newest book which is called t-bot or things become other things and hmm. it is 
I mean, all of his stuff is based on his writing. Like he says, all of my books build off the platform of writing, or of, of walking, rather. All of my books build off the platform of walking, using walking as a foundation to think about other things in life and in the world. And so what he does is he'll go on these long walks that are like week-long or month-long walks, and he'll be writing about the experience every day, sending out little pop-up newsletters that I've talked about in the past. And all of this writing eventually culminates into a book. Everything he does is for the end product of a book, which I think goes hand in hand with that doing things a little bit differently because he's yeah. not just writing to send out to art or to websites or to other publications or anything. He's writing specifically with that goal in mind. Um, yeah. And like I said, he's just released, by the time this goes out, T-Bot will be available for like for sale and everything. Um, and it's just, it's this 240 page B5 size book. B5 is, hold on, let me look up the dimensions for that. Because we're Americans and we can't go by what everybody else wants to use. Yeah. Uh, oh God, now I have to convert millimeters by to <laughs> inches. What is going on? Whatever. It's a sizable I will say, book. It seems like <laughs> what, what, what he does is kind of the epitome of doing like his own thing, you know, like new and creative different ways of doing things. Yeah. Okay. B5 is like seven and a half by 10 inches. Put it that way. Okay. So that's, like that. that's okay. Yeah. And so both T-Bot and Kisa by Kisa are same size, a little bit different in terms of page length and everything, but they're all made in Japan using the printing presses that are local to Craig and just very fine art, high quality books that he's making. And I'm looking forward, obviously, to getting it, but still it, it continues on with that idea of doing things that are against the grain, not necessarily releasing a bunch of eBooks just because they're easy and make money quick. I mean, these aren't yeah. these aren't necessarily cheap books to buy. It's like I think a hundred dollars for a copy, something like that. You know what the uh, edition number is on them? So, Kisa by Kisa has sold. It's in its fifth edition now. About a thousand copies each edition. Oh uh, wow, that's pretty. That's pretty pretty decent. And T Bot is twenty five hundred copies. I want to say in its first edition. It's t- a thousand huh. signed copies and fifteen hundred unsigned copies. That's that's interesting. How how did you first find out about him? Through uh, one of our listeners, Dan White. Okay. Yeah, he uh, turned me on to Craig and a bunch of other people, and then our conversations have gone from talking about people and like idealizing things to finally maybe sort of getting some work done towards our own stuff, but. Yeah. yeah. So that's interesting. Have have you um have you seen anyone else that does anything quite like what Craig Ma does? Because I mean, it's very unique what he does. Not to, I don't think I've seen anyone doing what he does to the same extent. I mean, you're you're talking yeah. about someone who is entirely supported by other patrons. He has he won't he doesn't know the exact number of monthly, yearly, whatever patrons that he has, but you're talking probably over 2,000 people that are supporting his work at roughly yeah. $100 a year, something like that. So on top of that, he's just able to focus on living a very modest life and doing the creating the art and doing the walks and everything that he wants to be doing. Yeah. I feel like in order to be in a position like that, I feel like that's not something that other people can come along and copy a formula. I, I feel like the position where he's in is a result of, you know, first of all, his his creative mind, but also being in the right place at the right time oh, as, absolutely. you know, th- things are developing. So I would be highly surprised if other people are able to do a similar thing in the same way that he does it, um, just because it is that unique and it is that specialized. I think it's something a lot of people look at and like, man, I would love to be able to do that. But to me, it strikes me as, as something that very few people would actually be able to do. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's absolutely a goal of mine to at least attempt to get there. But at the same time, like you say, yeah. I mean, this Craig's been 
working at this for over 20 years. I mean, he, he started working for a, a book publishing company back when he first moved to Japan and then was, um, so he was helping them to publish books and everything, then went off and started to make his own zines and small books like that, just using like print on demand and blurb and stuff. And then somehow he fell into the crowd of, um, I don't know if you know Dan Rubin. No, I don't. Dan Rubin is a uh, really accomplished photographer. I think he's, yeah, he's a creative director, photographer, designer. Um, and so Craig fell in line with Dan Rubin along with the founder of WordPress. And they went on walks together. They start doing these Jap these walks in uh, Japan and kickstarted. It's, I think they were the second book to be fully kickstarted on Kickstarter. Yeah, so definitely a matter of being in 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 his position, doing what he's doing, but also at a time when all that is coming about. Though, like like anything, there are so many ways to put your own personal spin on something and and take inspiration from something like that but at the same time you know focus that energy in a way that makes it your own in your own creative way i, I guess in some ways like if a a person sees i don't know, like like a, like a youtube channel or something like that they're inspired to do something but then when they start doing it they find that there's they have their own unique way of doing it and there's there's certainly a place for all of that but that would be a pretty awesome goal to be able to have something along those lines where you have the ability to uh, create really um, things with a deeper meaning. Yeah. Um, things are more true to yourself, things, but without the pressure that comes along with trying to, you know, uh, appeal to the masses and to try to make your work stand out more amongst all the other loud stuff that's out there and try to shout above the crowd. So um, that would be a, a really great place to be. Um, and and it's, it's pretty awesome to hear what he's been able to do. And I, I do wonder from his perspective, you know, how that must, how that must feel, you know, in terms of if there is also some degree of pressure that comes with it to be in that position, even though it seems like it's it's shaped around a lifestyle that takes away much of that pressure. Why is this not working? I'm trying to send you over this link of his... There it is. There we go. It just sent you over the link of that. It's, uh, things become other things. You need to check out. Oh, it's in the yeah. chat. What a nice little feature. Yeah, I didn't even know that existed. That's a cool looking book. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, I mean... It's definitely a long road approach. It's definitely a slow growth kind of approach to getting to that point. And like I said, it took him 20 yeah. some years to be able to sort of figure it out. And he's still actively struggling to not, not to say struggling in the sense that he isn't making enough money to live or anything like that, but struggling to navigate that path because it's a very odd path that he's taken and there aren't very yeah. many archetypes to look at. I mean, you're talking about creating work openly, not really, you're not making articles or anything specifically for the people that are supporting you. So it's not like he's yeah. making a single book of, I don't know, a thousand copies of a book just for members and you have to be a member to buy yeah. it. It's more of anyone can buy what he creates. Anyone can read the articles and the essays that he makes. But yeah, it's, yeah. So it's one of those things that, is definitely a goal of mine, but and when I think about it, if I want to make books like he does, if I want my ultimate, if I want the ultimate culmination of my work to be books, which I do, then I kind of see having two main approaches to it. Whereas the first is getting a job teaching or some other supplemental income and mm -hmm. slowly building up that work, slowly building this book and putting it together and building up the audience and the awareness around my work and then launching it as like a more of a side project kind of thing and seeing how that goes then. And because that way I don't have any true, I don't have any pressure on me to do it in any certain way. Yeah, for sure. Or the second option is trying to figure out the approach of Craig and figure out how to do something where I am fully uh, patron supported and go that route. 
but I think ultimately it's going to become a it's going to be a combination of the two that's required at least until you get to a certain yeah. point. Like I could I could go yeah. off and I could teach for say twenty years, twenty five years, and then finally be able to be like, hey, I am making enough from my memberships that I'm able to do this. But again, it's all about that slow growth. Slow growth. Yeah, yeah, that's um, it's definitely something to to aspire to in terms of seeing what other people have been able to done <laughs> been able to done <laughs> your brain's done can you tell that i've been writing my name a lot on the back of prints yep. today i warned yeah, you when i, I emailed know. you earlier like you don't numb yeah. yourself out too much for this otherwise we are we're screwed yeah like one of the past episodes when my voice was nearly given out now it's my brain that's nearly given out and yeah yeah we'll see we'll see on that <laughs> um i was i was thinking uh the other day about um there's there's been a couple milestones in terms of with my own photography in terms of things that I have purchased that ended up being extremely beneficial and in some ways were a bit of a turning point for my photography. They don't have to be big things. It could be small things. And it got me thinking uh, along those lines. And so uh, one such thing was when I got a printer. Um, and being able to to print my own work, and actually, I, I bought the printer secondhand from a customer of the camera store who just wasn't really using it very much. And I had I had worked with the printer in the past, but somehow getting the printer this time is really what led to me eventually doing the print portfolios and better uh, getting a sense of my work, which eventually led me to be able to you know do this as as a career. And the other thing I was thinking is the little uh, compositional frame that I use when I go on the trips just to put a rectangle on a scene to preview a composition. That is also one of the things that has been kind of revolutionary for me and able to uh, better make sense of a scene. And, and it was also the case when I was on my fall trip, there was a scene I stopped and stared at for many times for the past 10 years. I could never find a composition on it. But this time with that little frame in mind, I found a composition right away. So I guess my question to you is if there have been any things that you have purchased for your photography that have been sort of those those pivotal things that that sent you in a direction that was beneficial. And I this kind of comes up with all the uh, we're recording this a few days before Thanksgiving. They're Black Friday. You see ads for everything and think about how much of that stuff is not truly useful, but there are those things that are. So is, is there anything that comes to mind for you in terms of something that has changed your thinking and, and been beneficial for your photography? Um, I think the two things. So the first thing that I can think of would be like you with a printer that I have, just because I think of my photographs as something that should be tangible as the print as of the final product and there's just something as everybody always says anyway but there's something about seeing your photograph as a print even if it's like a five by seven or an eight by ten nothing huge but still being able to see little corrections that need to be made um especially working with film, the dust spots and that kind of thing that you may have missed that show up a lot yeah. more clearly in a print than they do on the screen. Um, little things like that that are always helpful. And I never really release any work into my portfolio in, unless it's printed beforehand. So yeah. printer was definitely kind of like a pivotal thing. But then other than that, really, it's just books, which sounds... Which sounds like a weird answer when you're talking about like something that helps with no, that's, photography. No, that, that's a great answer. And I'm, I'm curious, is it just just like just books in general? Because I know you have a very extensive library of, of books <laughs> that, that you haven't even gotten to yet. <laughs> yeah. Is any particular type or anything? I mean, it kind of varies a bit. I know like, and I've talked about it before, Guy Tall's More Than a Rock has been was majorly changed my way of thinking around photography, around nature and creativity mm -hmm. in general. Um, then there are also books of like, I don't know, I got to come up with an example of The Road by Cormac McCarthy. Um, and 
reading that and like the it's a non or it's a fiction piece but it's still seeing a different way of writing a different way of creating that kind of gives me a jumping off point to see how can i do something similar with photography how can i challenge myself differently with photography or break rules that everybody else is using and conforming to but i don't necessarily need to um and then more along like nonfiction lines um braiding sweetgrass was another big one that i bought that just is another realization of the importance of nature and protecting it and seeing the more intimate details mm -hmm. and enjoying your time out in nature not just with a camera not just photographing but just being in general so i think the that's definitely the most pivotal uh purchase that i've ever made is just books in general expanding my knowledge especially around nature and creativity that's good that's 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 a good answer i i did i did not real i did not think you'd go in that direction which is i mean that's that's a very good direction because it, it all of it a lot of it comes from you know drawing inspiration from things as as much as it is about the actual you know process of of going out and and photographing things um but yeah it, it, and it's also interesting how the the printer is something that's in common i think that is something that not a lot of people place as much emphasis on as they really should um because just as you're saying you know if you print an image you will see it differently than how you see it on the screen yeah and uh even one of the images that was going to be in my print portfolio, it looked great on the screen. I printed it and I immediately noticed something about it that really stood out to me when I saw the print. And so I went back and looked out on the computer monitor again. And sure enough, I couldn't unsee what I had seen uh, when, I, when I did the print. And I just made a, a subtle little change to it and was able to, to fix it. And, and at that point now, what I saw on the computer monitor after changing it now kind of it, it it looked good at that point and then the the print i produced as a result looked good so um it's just it really should be part of many people's process of photography because it just gives that it gives you a better ability to critique your own work and to see it with a little less of a bias somehow just seeing it on paper uh, has a has a pretty big impact in that way yeah so and it's never just printing it and immediately looking at it and then saying yes or no to it it's always a print it, pin it up on the wall or to a whiteboard or something and let it sit there for a week or however long. Yeah. Let it sit. And one thing that I like to do as well is, and I don't do this very often, but every so often I will actually frame one of them that I'm just, I'm just not sure if I like that piece. And so I live with it for oh, a little while. And I, I actually have two uh, photographs of from my prints or my coke series and uh i've had those just hanging on the wall for a while because i like them but i wanted to see if it was actually something that i would be willing to hang in my house as a series or if that is strictly for yeah. like a book and i've had them up for a couple months now and i still don't get tired of seeing them so that's definitely something to consider as well that don't just print don't just go and get prints even if you order prints online from i don't know wherever or if you print them off at your yourself at your house don't just t quick take a look at them or sit on them for a day sit on them for a while actually live with these pieces because you're yeah. expecting someone else to do the same you're selling if you're selling these prints you're expecting them to hang them on their walls and enjoy them for an extended amount of time because the last thing that you want is somebody buys one of your photographs as this large print, they get it a week later, they're like, eh, kind of tired of it. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point about living with it for a while. And actually, as, as I say this, I'm looking in the corner of my office and I have this uh, kind of tall corner uh, shelving unit, which it has a metal frame and then wood shelves on it. And on the metal frame, I have some magnets on there. And um, it's an area where after I make a test print, I'll routinely just stick it on there with a magnet. And there's one image on there right now, which is uh, an image from my fall trip, which um, I really do like, though it, it didn't quite fit into it to be a part of the portfolio, um, the print portfolio this year, just because it was kind of similar to another one that's already in there. 
uh, but it is one that is in the zine this year and it's it's still uh up there with a the magnet and and i'll leave those up there for quite a while and occasionally i'll, I'll take them down i'll i'll look at them in some indirect window lighter i'll take it outside and just see how um if i am still satisfied with how they look and in this one i'm 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 quite satisfied with how it turned out but i think having that sort of place um is nice and, and i've i've thought about having a you know somewhere some sort of magnetic board um that's a bit of a larger one where i can put a larger print up and look at it but i really like your idea of of putting it in a frame because that way you elevate that image beyond simply a print but when you view it in that situation where it's framed and it has that elevated presentation i can see how that would take it to another level in terms of of seeing it you know on a on a daily basis in that situation yeah. um so that's 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 pretty cool is it a frame it has just like a like a white mat in it or something along those yeah, lines it's just a i think they're frames that i had gotten for an art show that i had done a couple of years ago um and just had laying around but Normally, I'll just go down to Michael's or some craft shop and pick up cheap frames that are on sale for specifically for that purpose. So you, it doesn't have to be like some fancy, expensive frame that you're doing it in either. But I always, I always yeah. have it mad at. Yeah, that's good. That's good. And as as we're recording this, this is uh, the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, and so I, I know that my inbox is being inundated by all the the black friday stuff oh yeah <laughs> lovely and it, yeah it's i i've always kind of made fun of black friday a little bit just because it just i don't know whenever i see everyone all doing the exact same thing and following the same path and i know that, that it's something that's done because it works because people are in in the mood to start spending money and this and that but i i've never felt inclined to do any sort of like black friday sort of special or anything like that cuz i feel like it everything just gets lost in 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 everything else going on and and i've i've also been thinking about doing even if i was doing some sort of sale i would almost think i'd i'd frame it around like thanksgiving even though it's more of just a usa thing but like i don't know frame it around thanksgiving as opposed to framing it around black friday um but I don't know my 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 inbox. I'm just hitting delete a lot. It's just nothing but Black Friday stuff. I, do you have any thoughts on Black Friday and you know photography promotions and anything along those I lines? I stay far away from them all as much as I can. Yeah, I it's like I just got one not too long ago in my inbox that was someone who does who sells eBooks and maybe a couple other little trinket things, online things, whatever. And they're promoting it as a um, as a bundle for this super cheap price, like slashed price. And I'm just thinking, like long term, what does that do to the value of what you're providing? Yeah. Like if you are, I don't know exactly what the price was, but say it's fifty bucks for this bundle. If each of your eBooks is twenty bucks, and you're including, I don't know, four eBooks, something like that. Like what does that do for how people actually see the value? The value that you're trying to provide in each of those ebooks if you're just slashing the price yeah so yeah it does it does devalue things a bit and i mean even um, when you which when you look at like big box stores and all that stuff too there a lot of them will increase their prices incrementally from like september october into november and then the black friday sales are just slashing them back down to the regular pricing anyway so yeah are you really saving anything but i don't know yeah, I, I was, I was debating something. I still might do it. I don't know. We'll, we'll know by the time that this airs. Um, but I was thinking of being rebellious for the sake of being rebellious. Because that's usual and Ben Horn status. That's, that's, that's what I do. <laughs> that's, that's how I roll in spandex. But um, I have some, some Fuji Provia 120 film um, that's in my freezer. I, it was given to me a while back by fuji as part of some instagram thing where they it was it was like a like a weekly contest or something like that that i didn't realize i had entered um through like using a hashtag or something like that so they used one of my images and they sent me some free film which was kind of cool um but i still have some of that 120 film in my freezer so i'm thinking about just like doing something where i just give that film away as as like a 
more of like a Thanksgiving thing as opposed to like a Black Friday yeah. thing. Um, just because like I, I, I don't own a 120 camera. Um, <laughs> I, th- I thought I was going to get like a like a house of blood or something like that. But I just, yeah, I don't, I don't think I have the need for it, but yeah. So I'm thinking about doing something rebellious and just giving stuff away, just being different for the sake of being different. Cause everyone's going one way. I'm like, ah, I got to go the other way. It's just kind of what's, what's built into my rebellious DNA. Yeah. I, but I if know. I would ever do like a, a true black Friday sale or any kind of sale on prints or any of that stuff, I, I don't know. I think if, like going back to our earlier conversation with Craig Maud, how he does all of his books, all of his prints, anything that he sells, the biggest benefit you get from becoming a member of his special projects is if you're a yearly member or a lifetime member, you get pretty heavy discounts on what he sells. So you'll get like $40 off or a book or like $80 off a book bundle or something with this latest launch. But I've always thought of doing something similar to that. Like if you're a member of like our Patreon for Creative Banter or I'll just pick like a day, a random day in the year, and that'll be like the Creative Banter sale. <laughs> and you get like a discount code yeah. for that or something. But I, I think that would be more more spontaneous, more fun to do than anything else and to give back to like listeners or to if I were to start selling prints or ebooks or anything like that just having it be specifically for like giving a discount code in the middle of an episode just randomly being like hey yeah. there's a certain word that i used in here that is a discount code like it's fun scavenger hunt because again yeah. something different but do you do you remember it, it's been a while since i've done this do you remember the the secret giveaways that i did in the past on youtube yeah 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 i i, I it just occurred to me that i have not done one of those for a while but just by intentionally making the the video title as boring as possible so that the YouTube algorithm just like looked at it in disgust and <laughs> just kept going. Um, and I, I think it's also because I had, you know, it's more so um, equipment I was looking to move on and, and to give away and stuff like that. Um, but I, I really should get back to doing that again because that, that was that was kind of fun where it was. I can't even remember some of the titles I used for some of the videos, but it was like, you know, like second bi-weekly semi-annual progress report of the blah, blah, blah. It was, it was, there were horrible titles and horrible thumbnails. I want to see if I can find one now. Uh, oh yeah. Good luck searching for it. Yeah. <laughs> to go back through all those videos. Um, but yeah, they, they were, they actually worked out pretty well. Um, just because the only people that ever really saw those videos were people that were actively subscribed and would actually watch them. Um, but I, I, maybe I should do something like that, uh, at some point as well. I, I, at some point I build up some, uh, some older equipment to, to give away. Um, but I don't know. I, I, I think it's kind of fun just to, to, to do that sort of stuff from time to time. But I, 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 I have a feeling you probably won't even find any of those videos because they are just buried so deep in there. I'm trying. I did find a video that you have that is uh, titled Second Bi-Quarterly Semi-Annual Channel, yes. Status, Up- Channel Status Update Chicken <laughs> Dinner Winners. <laughs> okay. So, th- so that, that I may- maybe I got rid of the actual original one and it was just the, the winners <laughs> on there. <laughs> But uh, I don't know. I, I, I do enjoy just kind of messing with the system in that way where it's, you know. Here we go. I got it. There we go. Okay. It's titled Second Bi-Quarterly Semi-Annual Ch- Channel Status Update or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the Yeah, whole YouTube title. is not going to pick that one up. No. What did you give yeah. away here? No, ironically, one of those will go viral at some point. I'm like, ah, oh, they're on to yeah. me, you know. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's. That's that's something I gotta I gotta get back into doing again. Once once I'm through all the work from uh, from the print portfolios and everything in the zines, then then perhaps I'll go through and do a little inventory of some stuff to to give away and do that because that was that was always kind of a, a fun thing to do. Yeah, yeah, it's something to consider too for on here. That'd be fun every so often, like yeah, I said, that's right. to to just throw in a little discount code or something like that, or some kind of giveaway or something. That yeah, I mean, I have. Because, I mean, I think about it, I get, because of reviewing these, like, uh, photo books for Nature Vision magazine, I have such a, like, such a large backlog of books anymore. And I could definitely consider 
giving away books here and there that I don't want anymore, that I don't need, or something along those yeah, lines. Yeah, just move them along to 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 another home so they can enjoy exactly. them. And that's 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 a pretty cool angle on that as well. So I, I think there's I think there's some potential for that. I think that people uh, listening to this would would appreciate it because I mean they have like a one in eight chance of winning. Yeah, so exactly. That's, you know that's. That's pretty well, that, good. So, I mean, it's got to be more than that. We have what I think 18, 19, 20 patrons, something like that. So it's a little That's bit. True. It's a little bit That's more true. difficult than one and eight, but it's still not <laughs> difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, for sure. Some, some, something. I think uh, we could have some fun with then in the in the future. A little. Of course, line. then we'll go through and we'll have uh, one of those will take off. Someone big will be like, "Oh my God, they're giving away books on the." P- podcast and we'll go viral with like a million downloads a month and yeah it would be terrible <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah can't do that anymore yep nope <laughs> got and burned gotta go to uh, sponsorships now instead i hope you enjoyed our creative banter you can learn more about cody's work by visiting his website codyschultz.com And you can find my work at benhorn.com. For further discussion, join us at patreon.com slash creative banter. It's a place where we can interact with you, the listener. And although we greatly appreciate those who contribute by joining a tier, discussions are open to everyone, whether you're a paying member or not. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you around next time.